Mark. Ik word er zeker vast aan die manier. We gaan naar de third and final corner van deze match. Oké, everybody. En we gaan het talk about the few murders first of all. Um, my special subject, unfortunately. One of the most murderous places in the East End is a place called Union Lane. Now, Union Lane is still there. It's just up the back on the left hand side in between the, the, lion, the White Lion and the, sh the shop next door. And that's it there. About six foot wide, about a hundred dwellings, and at one time, the 900 people packed in there. Some horrendous incidents when you go back to the old records. There was one occasion in the 1850s when a couple was asleep in a house and something was thrown through the window, it was actually a baby thrown through the window. So what you talk about barbarity, there really was some of that down there. To give you an example of where it was, where it says 8 at the bottom, that's Church Street in Union Lane, it's halfway to the right hand side. You see how narrow it was, a really dark, damp place. In 1839, there was a murder there of a man called William Kane. Bill Hamilton was a, a, a chimney sweep, and he, he lived with a person called William Kane, and they worked for the Fosters. The Fosters lived on um, Union Lane, and they had a decent house at the time. But one of the perks for a window cleaner, you got to keep the soot. And you sold the soot for sixpence to bag the farmers, so sixpence was a lot of money. And these two guys, both Irish, had a bit of a falling out. And uh, Bill Hampton's in the Golden Lion, and he's complaining, black is blue, he's going to kill this person. And he's got a knife as well. And the local policeman says, where did you get the knife from? And he says, oh, I borrowed it off Billy Kim. So the policeman actually saw the knife. Now, during the night, the lady who lives there is woken up by somebody hammering on the window. And it's this Hamilton man, and he's shouting, come and see a murdered man, come and see a murdered man. And the family raised, they go to the, into the, the outhouse where the, the lads are actually sleeping on, on sacks of soot. And they find Cain uh, lying in a pool of blood. And you can imagine, in a very short time, half the East ended down there. Because you get a murder, everybody wanted to have a look. <coughs> the local police came down and they recognised this Hamilton fellow. And they recognised the knife as well. So once they, they got the body back, once they got the post-mortem over, uh, they realised very quickly that this William Hamilton was the, murder, the murderer. And he was actually sent to Australia in 1839 for committing the murder. I don't know why he wasn't just sent to the Assizes and Home, but they sent him to Australia. But these things were happening all the time down there. And one of the, one of the best murders, and I use the word very, very carefully, is a, the murder of a woman called um, Isabella Taylor, Mary Taylor. And she lived in the Middle East End, and she was actually a, a second-hand shop dealer, clothes dealer in Zion Street. And on Christmas, of 1889, uh, Christmas Eve, she was actually seen standing out of a pub along the high street, and then a couple of kids so on to into a back lane, and the next time she was found, she was, she was dead. The police came along, they said, driving in the morning. His pocket notebook said that in 8.55, he saw the, the woman's daughter at the dead house and identified the woman. At 10 o'clock, the coroner was informed and an inquest arranged, at 11.30 he takes a stem for a little 12 year old boy called Trotter who witnesses everything uh, up to the point where the woman gets murdered. So we've got that much. But then he takes a stem from a girl called Frances Ann Gillens or Frances Ann Glenn who was a little swine. She was about 10 year old and she couldn't tell the truth to save her, to save her throat. Now the next day, Boxing Day, there's a big inquest and among the witnesses is little Frances Glenn. The first thing that happens is they all go down the, the, the dead house and examine the body and then little Frances gives her evidence and when they say to her, you know, how old are you? She says 12, she's actually, she's actually 8. Uh, what's your name? She lies about that. And then they say, what do you know about Christmas Eve? She says, well I was playing out at midnight and I heard the bells ringing so I knew it was midnight and I saw this woman, Mrs. Taylor, I know. She went into the back lane and then I left her, I went upstairs to my house and my mum and dad were there eating cake and they were arguing with Migani. And the coroner says, what they were arguing about? And Francis said, well, my dad wanted the axe and Migani wouldn't give him it. <laughs> Why did your dad want the axe to kill Mrs. Taylor with? Now bear in mind, she's just crossed on her dad for murder. Her dad had nothing to do with it. 
and the dad knew nothing about the inquest because they were still palatic for two years in bed. It wasn't until they got the son and egg one they realised that he was dressed up for a murder. You can imagine what the, what that, the state that house was. So the inquest was adjourned, they sent the axe away forensics, and it came back there was no blood on the axe that was found in the yard, just wood. She would made this whole bloody story up. I wonder if she got the axe when she got uh, back home. <laughs> But the coroner was quite canny, what he said was, it's murder, we'll only discover the, the person who's responsible when they have a falling out. He expected somebody to grasp them, but they never ever did. It was never ever, never ever solved. It's still a really cracking case, murder in a brothel. Now, you can imagine if you live in Henry Hall, on a Friday night, there's new wedding on, is there? <laughs> Especially in 1984. Friday night, head me all crap. So you've got to come to East End the sun and you go for a few pints up and down the street. And that's what Joe Storm did. Now he's a pitman, he's got a few quid in his pocket, and he comes down to East End and he meets there this gorgeous lass called Mary Ann Marshall. <laughs> that's a proper woman. That's a proper woman. So he meets Mary Ann Marshall, he's got three beers, a lot of money, so all day long they're drinking. And then she takes them back home for probably team crumpets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't there, so I don't know. Saturday, all day long, team crumpets. Sunday, all day long, for back for team crumpets. But what you forget, there's someone else involved there. It's a man called John Perks. <coughs> Introduced as common law husband, read into that pimp. Now, John Perks is a really, really violent man. So he comes back and he sees this man there. And he demands money for all the trumpets that this, this guy's eating. <laughs> the next thing we know, this poor, this poor uh, Pippin is down at the bottom of the stairs, dead, following morning. Now the inquest, what we've got to try and do now is to find out just what's actually killed him. And it's concussion of the brain. At the inquest, the coroner says, definitely concussion. Was he pushed or did he fall? Well, nobody ever knew. So basically, this John Perks who probably did hit him over the head and murdered him. Well, he, he walked away with the crime. The coroner's advice to Mr. Perks was, you've been a really bad lad. You've brought all this on yourself. So go away and think about what you've done. And that was the end of it. There was a brothel just around the corner. And this was probably the really, really the worst brothel in Sunderland. And there were loads of them at that particular time. The ladies involved were Margaret Scott, Agnes Sutton, Annie Morton, Polly Blythe, and Big Ann Fraser. Again, it's any family names there, I've got the family histories for all these people. So <laughs> and the worst one was the madam, we call her Mary Jackson. She was evil, not as evil as her husband and her son. This was Joseph Jackson, and that was her son, Bobby Jackson. Now, Joseph was the pimp, he was the one who actually ran the brothel, and the enforcer, the bouncer, was Bobby. It's been a really quiet night in the brothel, and all the girls decided to go to the bedrooms. Joe stays up, and he says to this last girl, Maggie Scott, here, I'm going to get a wish, fetch us a towel. So Maggie fetches him a towel, but comes back with the wrong colour, and it obviously offends his sensibilities, so she sent for another one. And he, he's recorded to say, for two pints I'll kill you where you stand, you stinking hole. And the next thing we know is that up steps Brave Sir Bobby and his mum, and they decide to defend this prostitute on it. And they certainly defend it. What happens is, he gets hit five times in the head with a pan by Mrs. Jackson. He gets kicked in the head by Bobby. He crawls up into his room, and he's followed by Bobby, who belts him a few more times while he's down. And then comes Mary with a poker. The dying declaration is finish me at once. And this is recorded, and then he goes to lie in his bed to bleed to death. Now then, Mrs. Wynn is the daughter, and she comes, she's an Irish lass, and she says in her statement, my father's face seemed to have been considerably rearranged. <laughs> and there was scarcely a spot in his body that wasn't bruised or bloodied. He was a bit of a mess, God love him. Now then, three years later, Big Aunt Fraser, one of the big prostitutes, comes in, raises the concerns, and Mrs. Jackson says, let the bugger lie where he is, don't worry about him. The reason she wasn't concerned, he was already dead. He was already dead. 
Now the Dr. Arbat comes and makes his visit. Now, what he said was this man didn't present a healthy specimen, in other words, he was knackered. <laughs> have a post mortem, and at the post mortem, the siege is what condition he's in. He's been in the brothel all his life, he's been drinking all his life, he's got sclerosis of the liver, his brain's almost knackered, there's hardly a good organ in his body. Now, at the coroner's inquest, the garage said, what happens was, the prostitutes couldn't tell the truth to save themselves. Mrs. McCabe across the road, she said, I saw the fight. It was a hell of a fight. There were people in the window watching it. The pawnbroker said exactly the same thing. Dr. Arbath says, Mr. Jackson was an unhealthy specimen. His self-neglect was obvious, and he was courting death on a number of planes. The cause of death, hemorrhage to the brains, hemorrhage to the lungs, Probably caught it, brought about by the excitement of battle. <laughs> <laughs> now then, the verdict, I'm going to let you guess the verdict. Was it either murder at the hands of these people? Was it accidental death? Was it suicide? Or was it because he was knackered anyway? <laughs> That's what the jury decided. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, a little bit on East End people, and some of them you might recognise, some of them you might remember. I don't know if you remember <laughs> this picture of a Striga. Well, that guy wasn't the first Striga, Sonnen had the first Striga, there was a guy called Cut of the Nutter. <laughs> was wounded in the Napoleonic Wars, he was shot in the head, and he had what's called front lobal damage. If you've got front lobal damage, you've got like knee break the system. I, mean, I think I'll show my mother's story because she tells it right anyway. <laughs> but this guy used to get locked in his room, and there's one day his sister locks him in his room, and every time he got out, he used to take all his clothes off, and you can just imagine walking on the promenade in Victorian times, and you've got this naked man with him. But of course they couldn't do anything with him. There was no sign of him. So he had to get dragged back to his room and put back in his room again. But Sunner had the first streaker. Go to the nutter. Another question is, who was Jane Antique? <laughs> this is graffiti from about 1900 at the bottom of the long bank. Jane Antique. I'd love to know where she was. Now some very naughty ladies. Scotch Kate, Annie Mullen, Lizzie Hope, Big Bella, and the worst of them all was this one. Oh, <laughs> this is Annie McManus, the acrobatic prostitute. <laughs> ev every boy in the East End of Sunland in the 1880s got a sex education from her. Not because they did anything, she used to do handstands against the Sand Street Music Hall with me knickers on. <laughs> You can just imagine the group around her, can <laughs> Bring back Andy McManus, I say. <laughs> this is dead body of one of you. When I worked in the East End in the 1980s, <laughs> she was she was lovely. I got a bit crap with a couple of the prostitutes down here. So it's not quite the word I did. Um, there's one of them had been the third generation prostitute, and she was proud of the fact God love her. I mean, she was a really funny lass, and her, her grandmother told her tales about the 1880s and 1890s down the East End with the prostitutes. And one of them she mentioned was a lass called Bridget O'Donoghue. Now, Bridget O'Donoghue, and this is her here, I've got her mugshot. That's her. Bridget O'Donoghue was in the Boar's Head one night, which is Boston, and what she said was, I, I, she's a, a dead man would get a stiff stick just by looking at me kittens. <laughs> this is exactly what the woman said, this is not gratuitous. So the girls are legless. So what they do, they come out of the air and they go down below the end where the dead house is. Now that the dead house did what he broke into because they're just dead people, weren't they? They forced the door and the, well basically they, they took the sheet off one of the dead men while she exposed herself. Now they, they heard footsteps coming, but this girl was too drunk to do anything. So when the policeman came, there's nobody there but this her exposed herself to this dead body. She became known as Dead Body O'Hare. I thought we'd done it here after that. <laughs> now this one here, Mary Miller, absolute topper. She gets known for prostitution. So she changed her name to put the police off. 
What does it change our name do? Funny. <laughs> Now, if ever you had, if ever you had the yellow pages and you were looking for prostitutes, that's the first name you'd look for. As <laughs> <laughs> you know, in Victorian times, the prostitutes could actually use a pub for the purpose of refreshment. They couldn't solicit, but they'd come in for a bit of a break, a pint of pint, before they went out again. So even though the guys in the boar's head was festooned with them on Friday and Saturday nights, they were doing nothing against the law. This is Fighting Cock Lane, a very good name for the best brothel in Sunderland. It's just up the bank from here, and it's that little arch there. And a guy called Sam Lewis, who God love my mental health problems, he used to come on a Friday night and his pockets full of money and up and down the, the high street. And he was found in a heap one day, and the police picked him up, took him back to the nick, and they realised this was not just drunk, he'd, he'd actually been given um, opium. So when the police made some inquiries, what they found out was this woman here, Elizabeth Anderson, Elizabeth Anderson had been one of the prostitutes in there, and they drugged this man to try and get the money off him. They actually got a sovereign off him, and they were, they were actually done, and all they got was three months apiece. Anyway, some canny folk, some canny East End folk. This is our first one. Everybody knew. What's our real name? Shirley Ritchie. I mean, I wonder, you, you probably all know stories. But the, what my favourite is when the building Lambton Tower. And some of the lads were shouting off the building site, as these lads do. And they're shouting, give a kiss, give a kiss. So she does nothing else, but she bends over. Shows up bare ass and says, kiss that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God, no, but she, she obviously had mental health problems. You know, she was obviously had learning difficulties. But, you know, she was embraced by the East End. And what a character. One of the... This is dead. Maggie O'Hare, Gypsy Mary, and the East End Fishwives. I mean, they were incredible people. So hard working, these people were. And the salt of the earth. There's a one called Gypsy Mary. Um, Gypsy Mary lived in, um, in, in uh, Burley Street. But when they were pulled down, she got rehoused. She got rehoused in, John, in, in Johnson Street, just up the road. And a lot of East End folks were put in Johnson Street. Now, she was married to a man called Huey the Horseman. It was a double of John Wayne. Wow. <laughs> that is John Wayne. That, that is John Wayne, by the way. <laughs> I didn't have a picture of Huey. <laughs> now Huey's boast was that he'd knock every tooth out of his wife's head. What, I mean, we're an evil man. But Mary said, I married him. I'm an East End lass. I'll stick with him. Because I've got that ring on my finger. I mean, it's strange logic, but that, that was the laundry they had. Now Huey had an enemy who was a double of another one of John John Wayne. Do <laughs> you know his name? Victor McClellan. Victor McClellan. Do you remember the, the fight scene? Right. Was it the quiet man? Yes. Where they went all over Ireland fighting. Sunan had a better one. This is Sunan's best ever fight. It was between him, Black Jackie, and Huey the Horseman. Now, I'm going to break it down for you. It's from a book called The Johnson Street Bullies. It starts off at 10 o'clock at 46 Johnson Street, where they meet up and give the first blow. At quarter past 10, they're a bit knackered, so they've got a temple party. <laughs> At 10.30 the scene in Waterworks so the police have all disappeared, but there's not a policy to choose his head. At 10.40 they're in Water Street. At 10.55 they're in the top house in Johnson Street for another pint. <laughs> at mid the scene in Millfield. 2 o'clock they're back outside of 46 Johnson Street. Still going strong. <coughs> Black Jack he legs it into the passage. He's then followed by Huey and the day three complete circuits of Johnson Street. <laughs> But then Black Jackie, Black Jackie stops dead and clashes the door, and this is not nice, this is not on. He clashes the door and hears his face. Now that's going to upset his wife. So she comes in, gets carried back home to her. Black Jackie then gets flat ironed. <laughs> 30 years later, the door was still off its hinges. <laughs> But these are real people. I mean, could you imagine being around? Now, one of the other people at the East End, a Crotton character, was called Mrs. Coggy. Now, she, I don't know if she got the nickname. 
I think her husband was a little bit indiscreet in what he did, and she decided to punish him. Do you know what her husband was called? He was called One Bar Harry. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure why. Oh, there was another one called uh, Flat Face Murray, also Dog Shit Murray. And we had a dog that used to shit all over the place. So instead of taking it out, because it used to get into the furniture and shit, so he just, just, he just cut all the legs off the furniture. That was Flat Face Murray. He, was, he had huge feet and he used to walk into walls. And he had a, he had a broken nose called Flat Face Murray. The Red Lady, she was a very, very famous one in the East End, a bloody nuisance, but she was a proper East End woman. And the only way you got rid of that if she was sleeping on your landing was to offer her help. Because she was so proud of herself, she refused and bug her off. Another one was called Fal Dal the Fight in the Bad Man. <laughs> This is Bull Rennie. Again, the family is still around and a really, really popular East End lad. Just hard working people, but characters. Another one called Jack Shear. Do you know what he sold? Rizzy Lips. Okay, five points. Who collected Mango? It wasn't Palmer's. It was Samson Bestwood. Now Samson Bestwood was a local strongman. And mind he was, he was a strongman. And he was such a famous person in the East End that Pathé News got to hear about him and sent a team to film him. And this is what they took. Now this is Samson eating a light bulb. And our food was scarce in the East End. <laughs> This is bending an iron bar in his teeth. And this is getting your neck pulled off by tug of war. But the next one is the best. The next one is the best. Now, when, when this is finished, look at the way he walks. He puts a grip on his head and he gets hit with a male. <laughs> and that was Samson Best of the Little Strong Man. I don't know if you remember this guy. He died last year, by the way. But again, a colourful character. I mean, I love the fact he was a crop painter, which is to send the Queen his pictures. I wonder if Buckingham Palace has got all his pictures. I don't know. But I mean, what a character. And of course you've got people like Jack Casey, the boxer, and his movies are just worth the weight in gold. But the one I love, who knocked him out in the Argo frigate? I don't know. I don't know. knocked him out in the Argo frigate. Now then, if you lived in the East End and you went for your holidays, where did you go? 1930s, with a bit of money, you went to Weedale. This is their holidays now, how many fifties? Now what they're doing first of all, they obviously don't want the police to see the registration number so it's upside down. <laughs> They've got a little cottage. And what they're looking for is something to me. <laughs> and you want not interfere with them people, weren't you? <laughs> now, this is them coming down the country lane, that's Jack Casey in the middle, he's a big lad. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they're going to be looking through all everybody's hedges. Now, what they're looking for that, that is that chickens that. and turkeys. <laughs> they've seen some. But they're filming this, they're actually filming them, <laughs> making chickens and turkeys. <laughs> And look what the day when they get them. Still twitching. Still twitching. 
Uh, they lick about four chickens and a couple of turkeys that have got them all in bags. Well, I mean, if ever you want evidence of the crime, you just develop the film. I think there's very bit of an animal in here somewhere. Now watch this fellow at the back where he's got a deal now. Where he's plus four on. He's going to give that last a bit of a kick. And the other one. I mean, why didn't they fist him? I left this bit on because it's a clever bugger. Watch him. Watch this fella. Yeah. <laughs> some more recent memory. When we lost the East End, we, we lost an awful lot. But there were still some places down there you get your enjoyment. Do you remember Studio 1 and 2? Yes. Eventually it turned into a bit of pornography, didn't it? And all the men with the max used to go away outside. <laughs> Not that I went to those things. But we still had places like this up the road. You didn't have to walk far to get your shopping in Palmer's Arcade. We still had places like this. Never go Do you remember those tube things where the money used to go in? We still had. You could, you could leave school on the Friday and you could start work on Monday. Jackson, Hepworths. Where I work, Brian Mills, in 1972 they took 12 lads on, 12 lads and 1,500 women. I was terrified. <laughs> now then, do you recognise this place? That's Jackie White's Market, which later became that. But it started off on the high street, it's that. No. Just down the road on the right hand side, Jackie White started off. His name was W H Y T E, and he hired somebody to paint the sign on his back on his barrow, and he painted I T E. He just left it. He left the game Jackie White. The sad thing is that the East End was dying by the 1980s, 1990s. I don't know if you've seen this bit of footage. This is the boar's head where we are now. And just behind it, and that was the last of the industry on this side of the river, really. A really sad end to a lot of our heritage, I suppose. But really the memories live on in the people of the East End and the, the memories that people retell. And fortuitously I was going through my, my, my collections and I found a picture that the last photograph taken me when I used to work in the East End. And guess where it was? <laughs> That's outside the boat said 30 years ago when I was a young lad. They sent me to foreign parts but I always remember the East End to me it was a privilege to serve people in the East End. I loved every second of my time here. And it's, I suppose it's, it's, it's really wonderful that 30 years later, Tony's invited me back here to talk about some of the people of the East End, some of the memories of the East End. And I, I think we're going to raise a glass to Tony and the boys said for the work they're doing to bring the East End back into its, into its height. Tony, God bless you. Man. Set anybody or depressed anybody. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Good night. God bless.